Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for joining us here at the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. My name is Megan Robertson, and I'm the Associate Curator of Interpretation here at the Frist. We're so glad to have such a great turnout for Tom Daly from the Norman Rockwell Museum's talk today, but I do want to just remind you that you should really stop by the exhibition after this talk and see these amazing works in person. And American Chronicles will be on view in our upper level galleries until February 9th of 2014. Just to let you know about a couple of other upcoming Rockwell programs, on November 5th, the Frist Center in partnership with Vanderbilt University's Office of Community, Neighborhood and Government Relations will be presenting Food for Thought, Visualizing American Art or America through the art of Norman Rockwell and contemporary African American artists. So this is a program that unites our lower level show and our upper level show um, for an exploration about what it means to be an American today. Also on November 7th, Trinita Kennedy, the Frist Center curator for this exhibition, will be giving a tour of American Chronicles at noon. And I also really encourage you to join us for our other Norman Rockwell lecture, which will be happening on Thursday, January 16th. Dr. Erica Doss will be presenting a talk titled Pictures of Feeling, Norman Rockwell's Affection for America. But back to today's talk. So today we're thrilled to have Tom Daly, who is the Curator of Education at the Norman Rockwell Museum with us to discuss Rockwell's brilliant career. The Norman Rockwell Museum is located in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, um, and it's the town that, not, that Rockwell lived in for the last 25 years of his life. Tom was raised in the Berkshires and educated at Berkshire Community College, the University of Massachusetts, and Williams College, all in Western Massachusetts. And he's worked in the field of museum education since 1992. During his 16 plus years with the Norman Rockwell Museum, he's taken on a number of different roles, all of them adding to his knowledge of the work of America's favorite illustrator. He's been asked to curate a number of exhibitions for the museum, and being a native of the Stockbridge area, he also has a unique view on Norman Rockwell and has written many articles about the artist. And I assure you that Tom is such a pleasure to hear, and it's such a pleasant show to see. So glad you're all here. Please, let's welcome Tom. Thank you, Megan. Well, thank you very much for sharing your day with us today. And uh, what a great job Megan did introducing me. I think she deserves a round of applause for sure. So we're here to talk a little bit about Norman Rockwell. Anybody ever hear of him before? <laughs> a couple people have? OK, great, great. Uh, <clears throat> and we're not, we're not going to get into all the little details of every single moment of his life, but we're going to cover a, an overview of his life and, and find out his kind of take on America. And that's why. Uh, when I titled this uh, talk, I called it Norman Rockwell Paints America, which I have to think he probably would have gotten a kick out of that title because his grandfather was a painter. He painted houses, slightly different than what his grandson did. And I, I have to say that Norman Rockwell was pro would probably also be very surprised at the fact that there were people in Nashville, Tennessee that were excited to see his artwork. I think he would have been very impressed by that. As we like to, we're going to start at the beginning. So right up here, that's Mr. Rockwell with that tall collar on. This is about 1911, uh, only about seven years before the Red Sox won the World Series. The last time, oh no, wait, they won a couple of days ago. Yay, all right, so we'll pause, all right. Um, so 1911, Rockwell, a young man here, a portrait with his family. This is his father, Jarvis, his mother, Nancy, and his brother Jarvis. Now Norman Rockwell also uh, has a son named Jarvis too, so obviously a popular name in the family. Um, and we try to differentiate the eldest son by using the name Jerry. So if on occasion, I, I will apologize right now, I might actually say Jerry in referring to Jarvis Rockwell. So here's Norman Rockwell. He grew up uh, in New York City. He was born in 103rd in Amsterdam Avenue. So right in the middle of the city. And he certainly saw the way that things were going in that very urban area. He saw people that were homeless. He saw people that weren't doing very well. Um, New York City was right at the point when he was born. They were just getting ready to join the boroughs together. So there was a lot of upheaval. And Norman Rockwell decided as a young man that he didn't want to show the bad parts of life. He wanted to show the good parts. 
And though, so Rockwell was very keenly aware of what he was doing throughout his entire career. <clears throat> so if we fast forward about five years to 1916, Norman Rockwell is 22 years old. He's offered an opportunity to be on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, a magazine that circulated about two million copies a week in the teens. And this was his window on the world. That's how he called, that's what he considered the post. And he created many images just like this one that show universal stories, experiences that we all might have or at least be able to recognize. Um, in this case, you see that boy pushing the baby carriage. And boy, is he enjoying that, isn't he? <laughs> and unfortunately, at that exact moment is when his two buddies happen by, doff their caps, tease him for just a moment, and then go off to play baseball. So Norman Rockwell is certainly aware of the fact that these kind of things can happen to young people. Uh, Norman Rockwell is a young man, as you notice from the photograph, we'll flip back to it real quick, um, wasn't really an athletic specimen. He was always um, quite slender. Uh, he, he was a little pigeon-toed, and he wore eyeglasses from about the time of this photograph forward. So he wasn't usually the first person picked to be on a team. As a matter of fact, when the kids in his neighborhood used to choose up sides to play baseball, Norman Rockwell would often be left behind so he wouldn't get selected to be on the team, which was in a way kind of okay with him because he would sit there and draw pictures of the boys as they played baseball. And he said in his autobiography that pretty soon the boys didn't want to play baseball unless he was there drawing their pictures because he would hand them out at the end of the game. So they get their own baseball card, if you will. So Norman Rockwell really found a way to use this talent that he had um, to forward his uh, interactions with other people and also to be able to communicate with folks. Um, I will tell you, and if there's any young people in the audience, I'll have you just close your ears for just a second or two. Norman Rockwell, by the time he was 16 years old, quit school. Okay, so not a good message. Please don't go home and say, oh, the guy from the Norman Rockwell Museum said I could quit school. No, no, that's not what we're saying. Mr. Rockwell was very excited about art and really wanted to pursue this as a career. He was lucky enough to live in New York City at that time where there were illustrators that were living um, in the area, so he was able to uh, become friends with them and use them as mentors. Uh, the Rockwells, uh, after Rockwell moved out of New York City with his parents as a young person, they ended up living in Mamaroneck, New York, and New Rochelle, so in the Westchester, southern Westchester County area. And that provided him an opportunity to meet J.C. Leyendecker, who was one of America's premier illustrators at the time, and they became pretty fast friends. So Rockwell worked for many different magazines. Here's just a handful of them. Don't expect this kind of technical wizardry throughout the whole thing. This was, uh, I was so impressed with myself that I was able to do this. Um, so it's just a variety of magazines that Rockwell worked for. Boy's Life, Rockwell started working with that magazine um, when he was a teenager. He became their art editor by the time he was 18 years old. So a very, very meteoric career that he had um, uh, in illustration art. Literary Digest, Country Gentleman, also owned by Curtis Publishing, the company that owned the Saturday Evening Post. Um, you can see that he worked for Life Magazine, and this isn't the Life Magazine that you might be thinking of. Life Magazine in the early 1900s was more of a humor magazine. Uh, in the uh, galleries upstairs, you'll see an image of a pilgrim with a sign that says, Ye Glutton, uh, nailed to the, uh, the stanchion that he's in. And uh, that's another Life magazine cover. So they really were interested in, in uh, sort of gallows humor most of the time. So Norman Rockwell, like most people, decided by the time he hit it big, if you will, with the Saturday Evening Post, that he was going to ask his girlfriend to marry him. And that's, I know the picture's very fuzzy, but this is really the only picture we have of Irene O'Connor as a young person. Um, that would have been about the age uh, that she and Mr. Rockwell met. Um, here she is posing again for her husband, over there the same thing. And then right in the middle, you can see this upside down photograph that the sailor is obviously telling a story about. And that's Irene as well, Irene O'Connor, Norman Rockwell's first wife. They were married for about 13 years. Um, didn't have any children, kind of drifted apart, and um, were divorced, in, in, as I said, in 1929. I will draw your attention to the magazine cover that I'm showing here. 
to give you a sense of who's working for this magazine, there's Edith Wharton's name uh, on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. So Wharton, at this point in her career, was actually living in France. And in uh, 1919, she'd get um, uh, France's highest honor for uh, a civilian helping with the medical course in uh, World War I. So Edith Wharton, you'll see a couple other names, and I'll try and remember to draw attention to those as we go through some of these other images. All of the Saturday Evening Post covers that Norman Rockwell did are all on display upstairs, so you'll be able to see all of them from 1916 all the way through to 1963. Anybody recognize this location? Nashville, Tennessee. Anybody ever been to Nashville? Anybody in the audience? A couple people, okay, nice place. Um, and there's Norman Rockwell right there. Right, there's his artwork. Maybe some of you knew it was Norman Rockwell's work when you've walked past it. Maybe some of you had no idea, but there it is. Um, this is a barbershop image that Norman Rockwell did um, early on in his career. And of course, where is it but right on the side of the barbershop uh, uh, Harmony Society. And, and I will, as long as, uh, are most of you good at keeping secrets? Some of you out there are pretty good. Uh, if you'll notice, this gentleman right here is holding a copy of a magazine. And I can tell just by looking across the audience that none of you are old enough to rec remember the Police Gazette. But the Police Gazette was a racy magazine um, in its time period. And, and because I work for the Norman Rockwell Museum, racy is about the most I can describe it. Um, but go up and look at that post cover if you have a chance and you'll find out what the Police Gazette was all about. <laughs> so I really just, just enjoyed the fact that uh, we had a connection to Nashville here. This was sort of fun for me to realize that this was on display. Um, I haven't yet seen it, but I'm sure it's still there. Is that right? It's still up, sure. Norman Rockwell, during his career, uh, painted mostly images of ordinary things stuff that we would recognize or understand or relate to, and that's really what he did. He liked to tell stories about you and I, and I, I think he was very good at it. So one of the things I like to do um, when I do presentations like this is, is I like to, t like to test the trivia knowledge of my audience. And you guys look like a pretty smart group, so I'm probably gonna go through a lot of these books pretty quickly here. So my first trivia question, um, which will get you one of the catalogs for the exhibition upstairs. All right, so there's some high stakes here. I'm very willing to take bribes, just saying. Uh, anybody know what year women got the right to vote? Anyone know that? Yes? 1920, right. Nationally in America, women get the, road, the right to vote in 1920. I'm gonna make good on my promise and deliver this book right over here. Just so you don't think I'm lying to folks. There you are, ma'am. You're certainly welcome. So here we have Rockwell's take on that subject, right? Notice, if you will, she's holding a pamphlet that says Harding on it. He's holding a pamphlet that says Cox. So obviously she has the pamphlet of the person that won the election. And they're arguing as equals. The majority of images from this time period, 1919, 1920, 21, would show a man usually sitting at a dinner table with cobwebs strewn across his fork and knife. The house is a mess and the tagline says, do you want this? <laughs> and that was the take. Uh, really for most of the illustrators and artists that were out there. Uh, Norman Rockwell had kind of a different approach to women getting the right to vote here. Um, so just wanted to draw your attention to that. You'll see this cover upstairs uh, for sure. <clears throat> and um, I think it's a good, uh, a good foreshadowing of how Rockwell's going to treat people as equals as his career goes forward. So one of the things they tell you in museum school is not to tell your audience about your favorite pictures. Okay. So I'm not going to stand up here in front of this Dodge or in front of this Ribestos break ad and tell you this is one of my favorite pictures. But we're going to sit and look at it for just a second or two. <laughs> and imagine that it's 19 it's in the mid 1920s. And what's this lady doing? Driving a car. Right, driving a car. So, so much for our continued progress up, 
All right, sometimes we have a couple of backslides here or there. It's, in my opinion, uh, quite an amazing picture. It's primarily black and white. Um, it's upstairs hanging. It's only about that big, so keep a close eye. You'll see it. Um, but it was part of the series of ads that um, Norman Rockwell did for Ribestos Brakes, which is a company that's still in business today. One of the things that we find interesting about this picture is that when we show it to young people, they often wonder why that lady has a knife through her hat. <laughs> so Norman Rockwell, um, during his lifetime, as I said uh, a little while ago, he married uh, Irene O'Connor uh, in 1916, and they divorced in 1929. Uh, Norman Rockwell had kind of a tough year in 1929. He had also signed on to do an illustration of a book. And this book had a lot of stories in it. It was a popular book. It was actually a bestseller. Believe it or not, the book is actually being printed in Nashville, Tennessee, as we speak. And it's a book called The Bible. Okay, Rockwell signed on to illustrate a version of the Bible. Thought, well, that'll be great. Lots of stories. Everybody knows them. I should have no trouble with that. Realized it was far too much work for him to do. So instead of calling the publisher and saying, I can't really do that, Rockwell decided to go out to Southern California and hide out in Hollywood. <laughs> that was what he was going to do. Um, so he had just been divorced from his first wife, and he decided he was going to go out to California and sort of hide from the, the Bible people and uh, also maybe get a new start. And part of his new start had to do with this young woman right here, right there. That's Mary Barstow. Mary Barstow was Norman Rockwell's second wife. They met in Southern California and uh, met and married pretty quickly. Um, they seemed to be uh, what we might describe today as a love match. They really seemed to admire one another. Um, she was very familiar with Norman Rockwell's work already. Um, and he was uh, definitely entranced with the fact that she knew his work as well as a number of other illustrators. So there they are um, on their honeymoon right there. Portrait of Mary, um, actually just above there, was done a number of years later, um, actually done after Mary had passed away, just to give you a, a couple of different shots of her. And this is the first time she appeared on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. Note the date, August 1930. So soon after they got married, boom, she's put to work. And here she is on the cover. And uh, poor Mary, she gets letters from her friends saying, Mary, we're so sorry. It doesn't look like it's working out between you and your new husband. And she has to, of course, respond back to this letter saying, no, no, everything is fine. I'm just posing for my husband here. No, no problems. Don't worry. Everything's going OK. And she would go on to pose for Mr. Rockwell a number of times as he would pose himself on the cover of the magazine um, throughout his uh, career. He appeared in about 94 of his own paintings throughout his life. And again, I'll just uh, draw, you attention, draw your attention to the folks that are working in this magazine right now, writing articles, uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Um, and look at this guy right here, Mussolini. So this was a job he had before his last job that didn't end so well. Um, and you have Mussolini here working for the Saturday Evening Post. So um, sort of the running joke with the Post, uh, with all of the authors and the, uh, and the artists, is that the Post actually used to pay up front. And that's how come so many artists worked for them, is because they would get a check right away and then they produced the work, which is really the opposite of the way most people did business, even at that time, of course. So now you're saying, wait a second, Tom, that's not a picture that Norman Rockwell did. Well, it's certainly an image of a woman that is working and she's putting rivets in the side of an airplane. Uh, the airplane, as you can see uh, clearly by my labeling here, is um, a, a Volte A31. Anybody know where those airplanes were manufactured? Where? Nashville. How come you guys don't raise your hands? I'm an education curator. You've got to know that was part of the deal, right? Nashville, Tennessee, this photograph, as you probably all know, is quite famous, uh, an image reminding people what women were doing during the war effort. And I'm going to draw your attention to this scarf that she has on her head. 
Um, and from where you're, seated, where you're seated, hopefully you can see that those little insignia on her hat are actually little bombs. That was a, a government issue uh, head covering for the women while they were working in these factories. Um, so I found this to be a neat connection to this area, the fact that here we have Rosie the Riveter um, actually riveting, and here's, of course, Norman Rockwell's take on Rosie the Riveter right over there. And then you're wondering, well, Tom, why is there a picture over here? It doesn't really look like the other ones. Anybody know? Here, well, let's put a book up for this one, because this is definitely a, a, a book worthy. So I'll be happy to give somebody one of these small post cover books. She raised her hand. If you'll change the oil in my car, would you be willing to do that, ma'am? Uh, if, if you could tell me where this image lives in real life. It's not just in my PowerPoint, actually. Lives somewhere. So I'm going to give you a chance since I teased you already. In the Sistine Chapel. Yeah, I have to give it to the lady in the, the orange shirt because I teased her by asking asking her to change the oil in my car, which I might have her do anyway. Um, there you are. And when, when Rockwell's working, what he does is he's looking at art from all over the world in order to help him create these images. So you can easily compare the image here to Rosie the Riveter and see where that body posture came from. Now the head is Mary Keefe's head. Uh, she was a telephone operator from Vermont, uh, about 19 years old when she posed for Mr. Rockwell. And this picture actually um, ended up getting her in, and she was teased a little bit at work. When she came in after this appeared on the cover, she, all of her coworkers said, where are your muscles, Mary? Where are your muscles? Uh, Mary's still alive. Uh, I, I am very proud to say that she's a friend of mine and um, she's getting ready to, actually she just turned uh, 92 years old. And I actually had her granddaughter as my intern this summer, which was sort of fun. So Rosa the Riveter, not only is she showing us what women are doing during that time period, you can also see that she has her foot very comfortably resting on a copy of Mein Kampf at the bottom of the picture there. And that certainty in her look is just pretty remarkable, right? This is our, sort of our secret weapon during World War II is we had these women who, besides taking care of children and making sure their houses kept running and letters were written to uh, their family members that were overseas, they were also performing tasks that they generally were trained only for a couple of weeks in order to do the jobs that they were doing. And a lot of the women that did this work had no idea at the end of the war that they were going to be out of jobs. I had one lady say to me, I, I did an interview with a number of Rosie the Riveters a few years ago, and one of the questions I asked was, what was your most memorable moment when you were working? And this one lady said to me, the taste of the orange juice that I would get when I would donate blood on my lunch hour. Right. Another lady said to me, and this is, gonna, this is a, a, a little PG-13, but uh, another lady said to me, she felt so good to be able to go into a bar and buy a drink and not be looked at as a prostitute. Because just before this time period, if you were in a bar and a woman by herself, there was only one thing you could be doing in that bar. And so I thought that was really an interesting um, take on the, the change in her own life. So here's Rosie's cousin, if you will, um, right there, the Liberty Girl. And if you look very carefully on the image, you can see a little torch. And in that little torch, it says WWW. Now, everybody can say in unison what the kids tell me that means. When I'm touring them and we're talking about this picture, all of them say, yes, it stands for the World Wide Web. I say, wait a second, 1943, not exactly, not exactly. So, uh, one last trivia question here, and we'll just find out what WWW means. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hands, because when, when you guys shout out, I can't tell who's answering. So, this is a hard question. WWW. And it relates to the war, obviously. Yes, sir.
you, you remembered very, very close. That was very, very close. It's women war workers. Was anything to do with women's um, work during that time period? If you uh, wrote a play or a musical and it had to do with women war work, uh, women war workers, then you might get that insignia on your on your uh, work. And what would happen? There you go. A lucky row right here. You guys should have moved up. You. Could have, um, and so what, what would happen would be, and they did write a musical about this. They also wrote uh, a play about Rosie the Riveter. There's movies about Rosie the Riveter. Um, so this topic has been uh, used many times. And for Rockwell, what he wanted to do was just to show the impact that women had. And you can see all the different jobs that women took up during that time period. Um, everything from working uh, on the railroad to teaching uh, to doing stenography, to delivering milk. And this is a little bit of Rockwell's process. He actually starts um, with a little pencil sketch originally, and then he gets photographs. He has photographs taken of the models. Then he does a pencil sketch, which is usually the same size as the finished oil work. And then it becomes a magazine cover. So the next four images are all related. And um, luckily, uh, in the galleries, uh, you'll be able to see the Four Freedoms War Bonds posters that are on display up there. So the Four Freedoms were inspired by Franklin Delano Roosevelt in January 1941, when he delivered his State of the Union address that primarily talked about America being an arsenal of democracy. Right? We're going to put a bunch of democracy in a big building and wait till people needed it. Um, and that was a little too hard for people probably to translate into their everyday lives. But a little bit later on in the speech, Roosevelt talked about the four freedoms, how each person everywhere in the world should have freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And those four ideas, those high ideals, if you will, um, became packaged together in the government um, found a, a way to use those to inspire people to think about the potential war a little differently. Right? Because America, up until the point of probably December 7th, 1941, had been pretty convinced that we didn't want to get involved in the war effort. We were going to help where we could, but we didn't really want to get out there and, and participate. But Roosevelt, he has to encourage people to think a little differently about this, considering what he knew about what was going on. And Rockwell, what he decided to do was to show these high ideals in ordinary settings. In this case, we're at a town meeting um, in Vermont. As a matter of fact, you can see by the booklet in that man's hand uh, right toward the front of the picture. Excuse me, Norman Rockwell is actually in this for freedom. He's right up here. He's about 50 years old when he paints these pictures. And this was his, uh, his, this was going to be his effort during the war. He was going to offer these to the United States government. And this was going to be, yes, ma'am. Uh, quick question. Um, was the guy looks like Lincoln? Was that on purpose? Oh, that's a, that is a good question. It's a good question. And you're right, it was a quick question. The man um, standing up resembles Abraham Lincoln. Um, he absolutely does. The man that posed, uh, his name was Mr. Hess, and he was an auto mechanic in Arlington, Vermont. And Norman Rockwell is a big fan of Abraham Lincoln, so I can't help but think that Mr. Rockwell encouraged that paintbrush to show Lincoln-esque features of that man. Um, and certainly you could connect him to a famous, a famous speech or two. So yes, I think that that's not a mistake or not a, an, over, an oversight on Rockwell's part. He definitely wants to um, give you that impression. He also wants to remind you that in order to have freedom of speech, you also have to have people listening. And he does that by showing a very large ear down here in this corner, possibly. Right? <laughs> so this is freedom of worship, and uh, very different than most of Norman Rockwell's paintings, as you're probably noticing. It's, um, it was painted using a monochromatic palette, so one color across the entire work in order to show all these disparate people as one group. Um, <clears throat> and you can notice the quote along the top, each corner that dictates of his own conscience. So Rockwell's just trying to remind us that we should be able to do what we want to do the way we think 
um, maybe keeping that Jeffersonian theory in the back of our mind that our freedoms only go up to and don't override someone else's freedoms. One of the neat things about this picture next time you're at a dinner party you can share with folks is that notice the signature along the bottom? Norman Rockwell's actually put the beads that that lady's holding in front of his name. Just kind of a neat little detail, and you can see that on the posters when you look at those upstairs. The lady holding those beads, her name is Rose Hoyt, and unfortunately Rose passed away only a couple of years ago. This is Freedom From Want. A few of you have probably seen this picture before. <laughs> Whether you've wanted to or not, you've probably seen it. Uh, Rockwell referencing, of course, uh, Thanksgiving to show us that a feeling that many of us have in the United States of having more than what we really need. And Rockwell here has given us a chance to see four different things that people need to have to survive and how they've been provided for. So everyone has a glass of water. Um, there's plenty of food there. There's companionship right, and shelter. So the four things that we really need to have to continue on Rockwell has offered us here. And then by putting that man, um, whose, his name is James Martin, by putting him looking out at you, he's inviting you into that table so you can have all of those things as well. Um, Norman Rockwell's wife Mary is right here. That's Mary there. And then Norman Rockwell's mom over there, Nancy, um, just across from her daughter-in-law. This is Freedom From Fear, and Rockwell originally had in his mind that this was going to be a Saturday evening post cover. So the story might read for, for some of you a little faster than the other three. <clears throat> and what we notice here are the two kids are fast asleep, so they're not feeling any fear. Dad has been reading the newspaper there, so he knows there are things going on elsewhere, but not necessarily in the small town where they are. Um, the newspaper that he's holding is actually a copy of the Bennington Banner which was the local newspaper in Vermont at the time. And they actually created an edition of the paper that looked like that, so Mr. Rockwell would have that to paint from, which I think was sort of neat. And right on the floor over there by Dad's foot, you can see there's a doll that's, in, that's been left behind, reminding us that that little girl isn't feeling any fear at all, or else she would have kept that doll with her. In the top corner of the picture, and I'm gonna try and use the Pointer here, right up here. Can everybody see that image? It's an image of a guardian angel looking over this family. So in case those other things didn't work for you, Rockwell wanted to make sure that he let you know that everyone should have this feeling of being free from fear. For those of you who are, very, are really interested in, in history, you might notice that there's a black curtain right here, and that would have been a blackout curtain you would have hung over your window uh, in case there was any incoming enemy aircraft. Now, a lot of people wonder what happens to Norman Rockwell's original paintings. Um, we have uh, quite a few of them, actually, in our collection, and we love to share them. That's one of the things that Norman Rockwell asked us to do with our collection, was to share it with everybody. Um, this painting right here, you notice that there are four guys working on the Statue of Liberty's flame. They're sort of maintaining the flame. What you might also notice, too, is that Three of those guys are white, and one is African-American. Now, the Saturday Evening Post had kind of an unwritten rule, and that unwritten rule was if you had a person of color on the cover of the magazine, they should be in a position of servitude. So every once in a while, Norman Rockwell kind of slipped one past them, we think. And this is one of the examples of that happening right here. There's actually a couple other men on the, um, uh, on the arm as well that you can see uh, trying to lift that bucket up. I get a little, a little scared of heights for even looking at this picture. And uh, this one actually ended up in kind of an interesting spot. Um, there it is right there. Um, a lot of people think this is my office. It's not, really. <laughs> my office is a little bigger. Um, but this is, of course, the Oval Office. Um, right over there is the painting we were just talking about. It was given to the White House a number of years ago, and it's been hanging in the Oval Office sort of off and on, depending on the administration that was there. The kind of neat thing about this is that just below it is a Frederick Remington sculpture. Now, Rockwell and Clyde Forsyth, in their early years of working, actually shared Frederick Remington's studio in New Rochelle. So I kind of think that's sort of neat that the two things actually ended up coming together in a way. 
So in essence, all of you own a Norman Rockwell painting. Don't try and go and get it, though. They're not happy about that. They, they won't buy that. Um, here we have a picture in uh, a dining car and a uh, New York Central train on, a, on its way down to New York City. And does anybody know the name of this guy right here? Anyone know his name? Anybody travel by Pullman car a number of years ago? A few people have, okay. Well, this guy's name is George. And I can say that with that level of, of, of factual uh, statement because every Pullman porter that worked for the Pullman company, his name was George. So George Pullman was the man that, that started and founded the company, and in order to make it easier on the passengers, who were primarily white, they just told the passengers to call the people of Porter's George. So you walk into the train and you say, hi, George. And that was a, a, a way to identify these porters so you wouldn't just say the porter or have to figure out what their name was. Um, so a little bit of institutional uh, racism there coming from the uh, from the train company. And Mr. Rockwell here shows this little boy who looks a little bit like Norman Rockwell because that's Peter Rockwell, Norman Rockwell's son, um, trying to figure out if he has enough money to pay for that lunch. Now, Norman Rockwell, in his, in his inevitable style here, also shows us what his son had for lunch. He had a chocolate cupcake. There's the crumbs and the paper. And also, you can see a dish of ice cream right there. So that was his lunch, because he's traveling on his own, so that's what he picked out to have for lunch. Um, Peter also has a comic book in his pocket. It's Felix the Cat. For those of you who are interested in comic books, might remember that name. And Peter, like all of the other models that posed for Mr. Rockwell, was also paid for this job. He received a brand new Lionel train for posing for his dad. Pretty good deal, I think. So you'll see this painting uh, upstairs as well. This is a family homecoming or Christmas homecoming. Uh, Mr. Rockwell is right there with the bow tie. Mary right here with the mustard colored blouse hugging her son Jarvis. Uh, her other son Tom right there who's written a number of children's books. Um, one's called How to Eat Fried Worms. <laughs> and he wrote another one called How to Fight with a Girl and Win. So, definitely has dead sense of humor. And uh, there's Peter Rockwell right there. He's the one that narrates the film upstairs. Uh, all three of the boys are still alive, and we do still refer to them as boys, even though they're all approaching their 80s. Um, actually, Jarvis is 82, so I guess he's not approaching his 80s anymore. <laughs> uh, all right, so we'll, we'll do maybe one more question here for a little tiny book. Anybody recognize that lady with the lace collar right there? You guys were shouting out. Oh, look at uh, Lady Rose. She put her hand up. Who, who is that? Grandma That's Grandma Moses. So why didn't any of you other people know that? That was amazing. Here you are. You're welcome. Well, Grandma Moses. So why is Grandma Moses in a Norman Rockwell painting? Oh, now I've got you all trained. You're waiting for me to say, oh, I'll give you a book if you know, right? Norman Rockwell and Grandma Moses actually only lived a few miles apart. She lived just over the border into New York State. And Norman Rockwell lived in Arlington, Vermont, when he moved out of New Rochelle in 1939. So they became uh, acquaintances and would decorate birthday cakes for one another and spend some time together. Uh, Norman Rockwell actually said when he met Grandma Moses, Grandma Moses had no idea who he was, which I have a hard time believing, I have to be honest with you. Um, Mr. Rockwell was a very humble person, and I can't help but think that that's a little bit of Norman Rockwell's humility showing there, because uh, when they met, which was um, right in the mid-40s, uh, Norman Rockwell had already had the Four Freedoms published and had traveled around the country to 14 different venues, trying to in encourage the sale of war bonds. Uh, so I think it might have been Rockwell uh, not letting the truth get in the way of a good story there um, once again. So here we are out in front of the principal's office. I don't have to ask which of you have been in this situation because I already know. Um, and, and what a look on Mary Whalen's face there, the model that's posing. She's so pleased that she won this battle, whatever it was. And 
Uh, we know she's getting in big trouble because her permanent record is being accessed right there, so she's in deep. Mom has been called, she's in there talking to the principal, looks very shocked at the whole thing. Um, but again, here's Norman Rockwell kind of showing us to ourselves. You know, those moments that we've had in our lives that maybe we should have been proud of, but we still are a little bit. Here's Mary Whalen again um, in Girl at the Mirror. Norman Rockwell was very, very fond of his models and worked uh, with them very closely. What would happen if you were posing for Mr. Rockwell? And I guess I probably should ask, uh, did anybody here pose for Mr. Rockwell before I start this statement? All right, so you would go into the studio and because Norman Rockwell tended not to use professional models unless he absolutely had to, they'd be regular folks like you and I. And you'd go in there and you wouldn't know what to do. So the first thing Mr. Rockwell would do is he would go behind the stairs in the studio and he'd pull out a bottle of Coca-Cola and give it to you. So already you're feeling a little bit more comfortable. And then he would say, so when did you move to Stockbridge? When did you move to Arlington? When did you move to New Rochelle? Wherever he was. And he would start this very casual conversation. So pretty soon by the time the photographs are being taken of you as you're standing there, you're engrossed in this conversation about yourself. And Rockwell is asking you, you know, do you have any hobbies? What do you do for work? Do you have any children? So you'd be there for maybe an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours in a long session. And by the time you were done, Norman Rockwell knew your entire life story. And you felt like you had made a friend. You had made a connection with this guy. So you were feeling a little bit more comfortable. You know, when you're with your friends or your family, you feel a little bit uh, more willing to do something goofy or make a funny face. Um, here, Norman Rockwell has just gained another friend as he has this person pose. And uh, all the while, you have a photographer there snapping pictures of you. <laughs> and Rockwell is saying, well, could you just move your head a little bit this way? Or could you look a little bit this way? Or how about putting this sweater on? Um, so he's very good with working with his models. And Mary Whalen, actually, when she posed for this piece, um, as most people, when they pose for Norman Rockwell, had no idea where their face was going to end up. I mean, you could be on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post, you could be selling giblet corn, you could be anything, who knows what you're doing. Um, so Mary didn't actually see this picture until she was about 21 years old. And her comment about this picture was that she was impressed that Norman Rockwell got the thought in her head on the canvas. And so obviously this young girl is trying to figure out what's gonna be the next step for her. She, has, she brought her doll to the attic with her mom's makeup and hair brush and comb and the magazine um, with Jane Russell in it, uh, wondering what's gonna happen to her, what her fate will be as she grows up. So marriage license, uh, the two folks in this picture, uh, the Mahoney's were actually engaged. Her sister had been asked directly by Mr. Rockwell if he, she would be willing to pose and she turned him down immediately said, no, 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 I can't, I don't want to do that. But my sister is getting ready to get married. Maybe she'd do it. So that's nice. Throw your sister under the bus. Let her deal with this, right? So um, Mr. and Mrs. Mahoney, as they would be known later on, go and post for Mr. Rockwell. Um, she actually, uh, June actually didn't have a yellow dress, so she had to have a yellow dress made so she could pose here. Uh, of course, when she was asked by Rockwell, um, she said, yes, of course I have a yellow dress. She didn't want to miss this opportunity. Um, yeah, don't be naive in thinking that people in Stockbridge weren't excited about posing for Norman Rockwell because they were. They were. You, you saw people all the time trying to make extra efforts to be noticed by Mr. Rockwell. Or, um, you know, in, in Stockbridge, there's no um, home mail delivery. You, everyone has to go to the post office and get their mail. So the mill's done almost always about the same time, about 10 o'clock. So you knew, if you were living in Stockbridge, that Norman Rockwell was going to be there looking for people to pose. So you waited till 10.15 to go down and get your mail because you might be able to say hi to Norman. Hey, Mr. Rockwell, how are things going? You know, doing any work that you might need help with? Um, some of the neighborhood kids actually used to go and kidnap his dog because when he would return Pitter to Mr. Rockwell, you'd get five bucks. So that was worth it, you know? I just condone dog napping. That's probably not a good idea. Um, 
Anyway, let's go back to the picture here. We have the Mahoney's here signing their marriage license. And one of my favorite details in all of Rockwell's work is the fact that she's up on her tiptoes to sign that document, make sure she's signing the right spot so it's all official. Um, the man posing as our clerk, his name was Mr. Brayman, and Mr. Brayman unfortunately had lost his wife only a couple of months before this picture was done. And Rockwell's having trouble getting him to have an expression that he could use. So what he said to him, he said, Mr. Brain, why don't you sit over to the side for a moment? I'm gonna work uh, on something else. All the while, he had his photographer taking pictures of, uh, of Mr. Brayman as he sat there contemplating, I'm sure, um, his uh, lifelong uh, partnership that had been ended only a few months before. And that's how he was able to get that kind of pensive look on his face there. But notice that Mr. Brennan's not a bad guy. He's got a flower blooming and a little kitty down there. So he's, you know, just having a long day. Just having a long day. And when you look at the postcards upstairs, you'll notice that June 11th, 1955 is actually the date that this image appears on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. So it's a little bit of an inside joke for the post readers there. Some of you might have seen this picture before too. We call this picture the runaway. And you've probably noticed that I've been saying we call the picture. Norman Rockwell didn't name most of his paintings, so we've kind of slapped names on them. And usually it's something clever like this one we call the runaway. Well, how'd we think that one up? Um, so you have a state trooper and a little boy, and this is the color study, so sort of the rough draft, if you will, right here. And that's the final work. You'll see the cover upstairs. And <clears throat> And that conversation between those three is just whatever your imagination might be. And whatever character you feel you could be in that uh, setting is who Rock will want you to be. Are you that little boy that sort of quested out there to find out what's going on? It's 1958 when Rockwell paints this picture. So the idea of space exploration and having a little bit more free time um, is something that people are thinking about. That state trooper right there is listening very carefully to what the boy has to say so he can find out if he needs to do anything. And then the guy behind the counter on the far side anyway, a little bit older, has a little bit of a sneer on his face. He kind of maybe he's remembering his own experience as a little boy running away from home. And you can see how much um, what we call visual editing Rockwell has done here. He's changed the age of the man behind the counter. The setting no longer is it a Howard Johnson's restaurant. Now it's a little diner with an older man behind the counter. The officer and the little boy don't change very much. Um, but we do see that uh, Rockwell gives us that chance to notice right away this boy's run away by painting that bag almost completely red. And red's a color, as all of you probably know, that attracts the human eye, which is why we don't have beige stop signs, uh, why we have bright red stop signs. And you can see Rockwell's first uh, idea here was to have it sort of more paisley, a little bit more of a pattern to it. So it does take Rockwell somewhere between three to six months to do one painting. So it takes him a long time to go through all these different steps and the majority of his work is done in oil. So in the early 1960s, um, uh, unfortunately Mary Rockwell died in 1959, I forgot to say that. Um, she died in 1959 and um, Mr. Rockwell went into a little bit of a, a depression, as you would probably be able to guess, and was having trouble um, working and was even having trouble sort of getting out of the house and, and doing some things. So he sought uh, some help um, right in the middle of Stockbridge. There's a clinic called Riggs, and the Austin Riggs Center is a psych psychiatric hospital. And in that hospital, uh, Eric Erickson was working and that gave Rockwell an opportunity to meet with him and talk to him about the problems he was having. And one of the things that Erickson suggested is that you get out in the community and maybe you just start going to things, take a class or something. And so Rockwell goes up to Lenox, Massachusetts and takes a poetry class. And in that poetry class, he meets Molly Punderson, who is a published poet and author. She'd been a school teacher and had never been married. She had just retired from teaching from the Munson Academy in Massachusetts. And so once they met, um, they became very, very fast friends and got married very soon after that. So um, she was really the person that encouraged Norman Rockwell to paint images like the one you're looking at right now. 
this image was so moving to um, Nancy Reagan, First Lady Reagan, that she actually commissioned a group of Italian artists to create a mosaic of this image and have it installed in the third floor of the United Nations building in New York City. Norman Rockwell himself actually isn't in this picture, but he did include an image of Mary. There she is, right there. And she was able to join Mary together with their first grandson, Jeffrey, who was born just after Mary had passed away. So it was an opportunity for the two of them to be together. Of course, Mr. Rockwell uh, reminds us of the golden rule itself by painting it right on the face of the, of the canvas. And then has, here's our friend Rose Hoyt again, um, has Rose looking down at it as well as a number of the other people in the image drawing our attention to that quote. Norman Rockwell, as you might guess, um, received quite a bit of hate mail over this picture. And here's a picture of Molly and Mary getting married. There they are. That was in our local newspaper, the Berkshire Eagle. And you can see the huge write-up it received. <laughs> it was four or five lines, that was about it. Uh, Mr. Rockwell, again, a, an ordinary citizen in our town, a guy that we referred to as the painter guy. That's how we talked about Norman Rockwell. We didn't really sort of get the fact he was famous. Um, and there's Molly. Um, there's Molly again and Mr. Rockwell posing for their Christmas card. And there's the $5 dog. There's Pitter. Grab that dog. It's five bucks. No problem. This painting is upstairs too, uh, New Kids in the Neighborhood, and it really shows uh, Rockwell's hope that the next generation uh, will be able to make some strides in the uh, racial tensions that were uh, present in the late 1960s. Uh, you can see the connecting points here, the boys with their baseball uh, gloves, the girls with their pink ribbons. Um, the fact that each of them have a pet is kind of interesting, I think, and the fact they have a black dog and they have a white cat. And the dog is the passive one here, the cat, the aggressor. Might not have assumed that when you first started to look at the piece, but Rockwell has made that very clear. He's made sure that you notice that sometimes you see something and you actually observe something else. So he's asking us maybe to be very careful about what we see. Top part of the picture, you'll notice your eye is brought to the back of the painting by this little bit of yellow on this furniture here, the yellow shirt there, and the yellow uh, rear end of that convertible. That convertible also shows us the two adults that are in the picture, the man unloading the truck right here, and the person in the window who's peering out like Gladys Kravitz, wondering who's moved into her neighborhood, and not looking very receptive to the situation that's in front of her. And the man, of course, unloading the truck is just doing his job, waiting to get this stuff unloaded so we can go on to do something else. And the kids, of, of course, are in the situation where they have to figure out how, it can, how they can work together. Because after all, a baseball team needs a catcher. And you can clearly see he has a catcher's mitt. There's Mr. Rockwell signing the painting we just looked at. And you might notice that there's a lot of uh, paint on Mr. Rockwell's shirt. That used to drive Mary crazy. And Molly, they hated it because Norman Rockwell would go out with a brand new shirt on, start painting, and then instead of taking a rag to wipe the brush off, he'd just wipe it on his shirt. <laughs> so, so people are people. Um, so here we have him, he's just signing his name. Now, again, I'm gonna ask you guys to hold this in confidence too. Norman Rockwell with um, his box lettered signature actually had a template that he used to paint his signature. Um, he had 14 different signatures though, so he didn't have a template for every one of them. But for this one, um, he's not actually painting his name there. This is a PR shot um, set up, as are most of the paintings, uh, most of the photographs of Rockwell painting uh, generally are shots that were created to be used somewhere, and they generally aren't Rockwell actually painting. Now this little boy right here with the baseball mitt, we saw him in the painting right over there. The little girl, same thing. There she is trying to hold that 20 pound cat. You see those little knees buckling from the weight of the cat. See the gentleman with the tie right there pointing to that picture? His name is Ray and that's him as a little boy in the picture. So uh, his name is Ray Gunn. That, I just say that's mean parenting right there. You call a kid Ray Gunn, that's just not fair. Um, <laughs> 
he, he's a nice guy. He's actually an umpire, um, believe it or not, um, in, uh, in our area. But there he is. He, he was working at the museum for a little while. We have a handful of models that uh, help us out at the museum on occasion. And there's a painting that, uh, that's called Problem We All Live With. This was in Look Magazine, as was the previous image. Uh, neither one of these would have been in the Saturday Evening Post. Um, Look was very interested in showing America the way it was. And the Post wanted to show an America that might have been or that some people would have liked to imagine occurred. So this image is meant to remind us of what happened to Ruby Bridges uh, shortly after the event had happened um, in the early 1960s in uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Uh, her being escorted to the William Franz Elementary School by herself to be educated for an entire year uh, by a teacher they had to bring down from Massachusetts to teach her for that entire year. And Rockpole, like many people in the country, were moved by this event, seeing it on, the, on television, in the newspapers, and in the magazines. And when he was asked to do this, he was certainly more than happy to show people um, the inequities that were happening to young people in the United States. If you look very carefully at the top corner of the picture, you'll see a reference to the Klan right here. And then, of course, the racial slur across the top of the picture. If you look very closely, and you can see this clearly in the painting, which is upstairs, right over in this section, right over here, it says, Pat loves Dick. And that's a little reference to um, uh, Pat and Richard Nixon. Over on this side of the painting, you can see a little tiny heart with the initials MP plus NR. So that's Molly Punderson and Norman Rockwell. And so here is Ruby Bridges right here, walking out of the school. This is at the end of the day. Um, here's Ruby Bridges again as an adult, Ruby Bridges Hall, and her teacher right there. We're able to get them together at the museum. It had been the first time they'd seen one another in quite a number of years. And it was a very moving evening, as you might guess. And right near the end of the evening, um, her teacher asked if she could take just a moment to tell a story about Ruby. And, and of course, sure, definitely happy to have you do that. So she said, I really felt bad for Ruby Bridges here. This little girl is being educated by herself. She's afraid to eat the meals that are here. And you know, she made it through. She goes, but I do still feel bad for her because at the end of the year, she ended up with a Boston accent. So this poor little girl was saying con, pock, and Red Sox, and all that kind of stuff. She probably didn't say Red Sox. I just threw that in there. Um, so there they are right there. And then um, here's Ruby Bridges with an admirer right here, um, and the president, of course. And there's the painting hanging just outside the Oval Office. Proud we were that that happened, I have to tell you. We, I was so excited. I was hoping that I would get a chance to go down and see the installation, but I didn't get a chance to go. Um, and here's the dress that she wore when she posed for Mr. Rockwell. So the little girl, uh, not Ruby Bridges, but uh, Linda Gunn, uh, who was Ray's cousin. And there's some photographs of her posing. And then there's a, a letter right here. And you have some letters upstairs that relate to a couple other pieces. And that letter right there is from uh, a man who wrote and said that the painting had changed his life. He had been uh, a long time, a uh, very uh, bigoted person, and he realized when he looked at this picture that it didn't make any sense to be that way. So upstairs, and I won't take an awful lot of time on this because you're gonna see the real thing when you go upstairs uh, in the exhibition. Here's just a few of the things that inspired Rockwell and helped him along when he painted a picture called um, uh, Murder in Mississippi. So in the middle, there's a page of notes. And the page, the actual page is upstairs framed. You can see it. And it tells you all the details. When uh, people were arrested, what the weather was like, what time it was, what the surface they were on. All these little tiny details you think might not mean anything. Rockwell's recording them so when he creates the image, he can create an accurate image. There's a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph right here that Rockwell uses. There's a, a picture from a news magazine right there, an uncredited piece of artwork that Rockwell used for the shadows. 
the photographs of the three men that were killed, Mr. Schwerner, Mr. Goodman, and Mr. Cheney. Um, in, they were published in the newspaper. Rockwell used those as references. Rockwell himself posing here with a white shirt with a smear of blood on it so we can get a sense of what that would look like on the fabric. And here's the finished work, which was never published. And you can see all those elements coming together to create this one image. And this is the image that was published. It was actually the color study or the rough draft, which was done in watercolor, which was a little unusual for Rockwell. And right next to it is the beginning of the article that this illustrated uh, it's called Southern Justice. And it was an article that talked about the inequities in the, in the Southern justice system. And as irony would have it, of course, the person that committed these crimes um, didn't end up going to jail until about 2008. So here's Rockwell's triple self-portrait. And then I just threw in a couple other pictures of Rockwell. She so get a chance to see what he looked like kind of throughout the years. Here's Rockwell, sort of the rock star Rockwell right here in front of his fancy studio in New Rochelle, New York on Lord, Lord Kirchner Lane. The building still exists. The family that owns the house has spent a great deal of their own money uh, refurbishing that building to look just the way it did when Norman Rockwell was working there, which we think is really neat. Um, so there's Mr. Rockwell, a young man. That one's probably taken in the 19, uh, maybe 1920s. Uh, Rockwell in Arlington, Vermont, posing for uh, uh, another uh, PR shot. Uh, when Rockwell laid out paint on his canvas, uh, I'm sorry, on his uh, white piece of milk glass right here, they were very orderly and they went in a certain design which isn't represented there. So that palette has been intentionally messed up to look like he's working there. <laughs> um, this shot right over here is actually a shot of Rockwell at work, work using a bolopticon in order to project an image onto a piece of paper so he can sketch from those photographs that he's been using. The photographs he's going to cut up into small pieces and use as almost a collage in order to draw from those, uh, those images. And then uh, this one over here is Mr. Rockwell uh, right near the end of his life in his uh, very, very early 80s. So the illustration in the middle is meant to just give you a sense of Mr. Rockwell himself. This is kind of who Norman Rockwell was hoping you would think he was. Ordinary guy just sitting around painting. Um, a, a big admirer of these four men right over here. Uh, anybody know this guy right down here? <laughs> Vincent Van Gogh, yeah, Van Gogh. Rockwell admired him so much because of his fast brush strokes and his very loose approach to painting, which Rockwell certainly didn't have. Um, Picasso, who wor was working at the same time that Rockwell was, as all of you probably know, and the man who shattered our picture plane for us. Um, just above, anybody know who this guy is? Rembrandt. Rembrandt, very good, very good. Yep, Rembrandt. They named a toothpaste after him, so he must be famous. Um, Norman Rockwell uh, admired Rembrandt so much that he um, would study his work and, and try the best that he could to emulate some of the light that Rem Rembrandt was able to create. And the last guy right up here, who's this? somebody said that with a fantastic accent back there. That was great. I, I'd like to have you come along with me, sir, because I can never pronounce his name with that, with that wonderful of accent that you have. Um, Albrecht Tura, he's uh, an artist that was fascinated by detail, um, did uh, etching, also did drawing and painting as well. But he liked to show images of ordinary things. And that's what Rockwell did. Um, uh, we think anyway, uh, showed images of ordinary things. So those were the four folks that Rockwell admired. He admired uh, almost anybody who could paint or draw or sculpt. Um, he was very interested in art in general. <clears throat> in his triple self-portrait, we see that he's painting a picture of himself um, looking quite a bit younger and more spry than he is in the reflection. Uh, so Rockwell gets it, you know, there's Sometimes the world looks a little differently than you think it looks. Uh, he's got his glass of Coca-Cola there, propping open that um, book, which is actually a book of modern art. Uh, Rockwell, one of the original members of the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. Uh, most people wouldn't have accused him of being that, but he was uh, fascinated by art. Uh, Norman Rockwell actually um, continued to study art his entire life. When he lived in Stockbridge in the 1960s, when he was there, 
he was actually taking art classes in Stockbridge from a lady named Peggy Best. And Peggy Best's expertise was painting portraits and also doing figure drawing. So can you imagine you, Peggy Best, for just a moment, you're standing up in front of class, and Norman Rockwell's looking at you, and you're going to teach him how to paint a portrait? <laughs> but Mr. Rockwell apparently was a very good student, uh, was very uh, willing to hear, and was very willing to learn from what Peggy Best had to share. Uh, he was uh, definitely a humble person, um, not only as an artist, but also as an individual. And this is where some of those paintings actually live. That's the Norman Rockwell Museum building um, right there. Uh, it was designed by Robert A.M. Stern. Uh, I understand there's another Stern building in your community. Um, this was his first museum building. And this is Norman Rockwell's studio. So we actually moved Mr. Rockwell's studio from its location just behind his house out to our grounds about 2.2 miles away. Um, so a typical New England thing, you know, we're too cheap to build a new building, so we just move it, you know, in this case. Um, in this case, of course, we moved it so we could protect the building and share it with our visitors. So one last trivia question here, and then we'll wrap it up. I'll certainly be willing to take any questions that you have. But does anybody know who designed Norman Rockwell's studio? Anybody know? Oh, I see a hand way, way, way in the back. Oh, and there's one in the front, too. Let's go to the guy way in the back. And that person's name was? Yes, yes, Einer Hamber. Wow. Did you know that, too, ma'am? That's very good, very good. OK, great. So it's all right that you don't know who Einer Hamburg is. <laughs> Um, his claim to fame actually was publishing books about measured drawings of Shaker furniture. And Norman Rockwell um, ended up using him to redesign his studio. And he used uh, Hamburg primarily because, first of all, he was an excellent um, designer. But secondly, uh, Hamburg's daughter worked for Norman Rockwell, and she was the lady that would answer his correspondence. So you mailed a letter to Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell would read it and look at it, but he had a number of different sort of standard responses. A lot of people would write to Mr. Rockwell and say, could I have a painting? Right? And so Rockwell had to have a pleasant, polite response to that. And his response generally was something like, I don't really know where all of my artwork is, and I'm not really sure which one you would like, but here's an, here's an autograph or a photograph of myself and would send that along. And so Ann Opperman would do that for, um, for Mr. Rockwell. Um, she actually, she, in order to help her job along, Mr. Rockwell bought her a Remington typewriter, a portable typewriter, and gave it to her so she would be able to work at home. And Ann is such a generous person, she actually donated it to the museum. So we actually have that typewriter that was used, which was exciting for us. <laughs> Might not be exciting for anyone else, but we were very excited about it. Well, that concludes my comments for the day. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, if you'd like to shout them out here, that's great. If not, I'll be hanging around for Oh, yes, ma'am. Uh, his name is James Martin, and he's in all four of the Four Freedoms. And his job was to get you involved in that picture. He wanted you to feel like you were at that table with the family. Yep, James Martin, just a neighbor of Mr. Rockwell's. Great question. Thank you very much. The question was asked about the person who was at the bottom corner of freedom from want. I just realized I forgot to repeat the question. Yes. Well, don't be so careful saying that. Yeah, people hated Norman Rockwell for a while, especially the art intelligentsia. And, and the fact of the matter is that one of the things that brought that on was the, uh, so the, the question up front was uh, Norman Rockwell's work wasn't as highly touted in the 1970s, 1980s, um, which was the time that I was going to college and studying some of this kind of stuff. <laughs> and, um, and believe me, when I mentioned that I had met Mr. Rockwell, my art professor didn't think that was cool. Did not think that was cool at all. Um, so 
what happens in the 1940s, this idea that art shouldn't be for ordinary folks, is that there should be some separation there, that this idea that uh, art is for maybe more high-minded people, um, that if you and I can understand it, then it may not actually be art. And that started to erode what had been a standard for hundreds of years. Let's face it, Michelangelo was an illustrator. He told stories with his pictures, right? So that was, in many people's minds, that was sort of a division. And you're right, it, it, it sort of filtered down to um, kind of everybody else. And they said, well, Norman Rockwell is kind of, he was the example for bad art, right? You'd say, oh, well, here's a boy and a puppy. That must be Norman Rockwell, you know? And, and the fact of the matter is, people can have their opinion. If they think that's right, that's good for them. You know, if you happen to enjoy the work and we're pleased that people do, then go for it, be happy about it. And the fact is that his work is um, being looked at a little bit more seriously now, thankfully. And, um, you know, we, we just think that Norman Rockwell gives people a chance to experience the fact that we're all going through things together. And he really does give us that chance to see ourselves too. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Um, one of the things that we were talking about with the docents a little bit earlier um, was that we were so excited that uh, the folks here uh, in Nashville wanted this exhibition because we've been talking about Norman Rockwell as a storyteller for years. And that's really what he is. He's a storyteller. And where else would you want your art to be but in the place that everybody in the world connects with storytelling, right? So if you're Johnny Cash or Dolly Parton, where do you go? Nashville, Tennessee, right? And so we were very excited, believe me, when we got that call and the fish were like, yes! So um, to uh, try and answer your question, um, yet uh, Lucas and Spielberg both looked to Rockwell to inspire uh, even literal scenes in their movies. Um, as you look back through uh, most of their movies, you'll see Rockwell vignettes in almost all of them, um, which is kind of interesting. And um, uh, Spielberg, as a young boy, of course, was very influenced by the Boy Scouts. And Rockwell did illustrations for the Boy Scouts for most of the 1900s. And it started, as I said earlier, as a teenager. And the last work he did for the Boy Scouts was in 1976, so two years before Rockwell passed. So he did a lot of work for the Boy Scouts. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Yes? No. <laughs> no, he didn't. Uh, the question was asked whether or not Rockwell did a portrait like the one that was in the middle of the self-portrait, and he didn't. No, he didn't. Thank you for asking that question, though. Uh, Mr. Rockwell was very comfortable when he passed away. Yep, financially, to, he did okay for himself. Yep, yep. And then, <laughs> I'm getting all sorts of slashing signs in the background, so I think that means I probably should wrap it up here. But I appreciate your time, and, and we probably would have a minute or two to answer some more questions afterwards. So thank you very much. Thank you.